All right, we can go ahead and get started here. I am going to introduce our speaker today. My name is Mary Kate Harrison and I work at the Arkansas Alumni Association. And I wanna thank all of you for attending another uh, one of our Lunch and Learns of our Lunch and Learn series. We appreciate you all being here today. Our speaker today is Matthew Waller. He's the Dean of the Sam M. Walton College of Business and is the Sam M. Walton Leadership Chair, as well as a Professor of Supply Chain Management. As Dean, he leads the Walton College, which has over 6,000 undergraduates and about 500 graduate students. He has been an active entrepreneur most of his life, he was co-founder of a software company which had over 100 employees as well as a consulting firm. He is a patent inventor who has also had his opinion pieces published in the Wall Street Journal and in Financial Times. Dr. Waller is an SEC Academic Leadership Fellow. He received a BSBA summa cum laude from University of Missouri and a Master's and Doctorate degree from the Pennsylvania State University. He is a former co-editor-in-chief of Journal of Business Logistics, and he is currently co-authoring a book with Kirk Thompson, the chairman of J.B. Hunt Transport Services, about strategy and how J.B. Hunt Transport Services apply various business strategies. So I want to get a, give a big welcome to our special guest speaker today, D Dean Waller. Thank you so much. It's, um, it's a pleasure to, to join you all. Um, Thank you all for taking time uh, to uh, spend with the alumni of the University of Arkansas. And thank you for taking time to visit with me. Um, we really appreciate our alumni. I know when I've traveled to other cities to meet with alumni from Dallas to Kansas City to Little Rock to Memphis to San Francisco, um, I'm always surprised how many alumni are willing to take time and, and visit with us and uh, give us input and uh, get caught up. And I really enjoy uh, meeting with alumni and hearing what's going on. So uh, a lot of times when these kinds of uh, sessions are done, people speak and then, um, then uh, at the very end, it's open to questions. But I'm the type of person I'm very happy to take questions. So if you have a question, um, you can, we can unmute you at any time. You can type into the chat. It's open so that we can see it. I've actually got it up on my screen, but I, I love interacting. Um, but I'll, I'll start off. Um, the, the topic that I was going to talk about and am going to talk about is leading through COVID, through the pandemic. Um, how do you lead through that? And um, it's really interesting that, uh, you know, if you look at a college, especially for those of you who aren't involved um, in a college, uh, alumni, um, we have lots of different constituents. We have students, of course. They're our lifeblood. Uh, we have faculty and staff. Um, we have uh, alumni. We have uh, legislators, we have benefactors. There are many different categories of, of uh, constituents for a given college. So leading through a pandemic um, is complicated. Um, but I believe, and so one of the things that I'm going to share today is that uh, having a leadership framework makes a huge difference. In leading. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my leadership framework that I use. Um, and I actually didn't create it. I took two different frameworks and combined them. I did this about five years ago. Um, I was using part of it for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the first time I've led through a pandemic. Um, I did my software company um, went through 9-11, and um, that was very challenging. Um, we, had, we had about 20 employees in Fayetteville and about 100 in Washington, D.C. And, you know, leading through that was difficult because uh, we were selling software and everyone put their IT budgets on hold right after 9-11. For those of you old enough to remember, you'll, you'll know that 
that's what happened. And that made it very challenging for us. In fact, we had to lay off about half of our employees um, and probably within four months of 9-11, right after 9-11. Uh, it was very difficult. Um, but, uh, but I didn't have the framework I have now. Um, and so I believe that this has helped me quite a bit. So I'm going to share it a little bit with you, tell you about some of the specifics. But again, feel free to interrupt me or uh, ask me a question or uh, type in a question. I, I love interaction. So, but, uh, you know, um, as soon as I became dean, I, I, well, first of all, I'll back up a second. When I started undergraduate, uh, in uh, 1982, my father gave me a book, and the book was called In Search of Excellence. And that was the first time I started getting interested in leadership. Um, and I've been interested ever since, and I've read a lot about leadership. I've led, you know, software company, a consulting company. I was editor in chief of a journal, and um, I've done a few other things, but now I'm uh, dean of the College of Business. I'm going to give you just a quick update on the College of Business, then I'm going to get into the leadership model. So real briefly, <clears throat> when many of you were students in the Walton College, um, we had six academic departments. Today we have eight. Um, the two that were added in this decade were uh, supply chain management in 2011, and the newest one that was added this year is called the Department of uh, Strategy, Entrepreneurship, and Venture Innovation. So it's focused on strategy and entrepreneurship, which is a big push of the Walton College and a, a part of the history of the college. Um, but um, so, and now another big change, our school is a lot bigger than when you went here, probably. We're now up to um, 6,100 undergraduates, and about five or 600 graduate students. Um, and to give you an idea, um, when I first became dean, we graduated about 750 students that year, five years ago. Uh, this year, we graduated about 1,400 students. So the, the college has grown quite a bit. There's a lot going on. It would take a long time to actually tell you about everything that's gone on in the past few years. We've added six new master's degree programs. We have a master's of science in economic analytics, a master's of applied business analytics, a master's of science in supply chain management, master's of supply science and finance, and a, master, a new uh, master's program in accounting. We already had one, we have a new one um, that includes emphases like tax and audit and analytics. Um, but at any rate, I'm not going to go into that for too long, but I'm willing to, to answer any questions you might have as we, as we talk. So, um, so back to this framework, I don't know how many of you are, are like me, but I like having some kind of structure when I'm dealing with things that are equivocal or uncertain or where there's not been a clear path blazed before. I'm always looking for, for these kinds of templates uh, or approaches. Um, and um, when I was introduced to this book that I was uh, co-authoring with uh, uh, Kirk Thompson, the chairman of the board of J.B. Hunt, I've known Kirk for many, many years. He's an alum of the college, actually. Um, he was the fourth employee of uh, J.B. Hunt. Um, and he is so insightful and I, uh, I used to have him come speak to my classes back in the 90s. Um, and uh, he's just a, a wonderful person. Uh, but we, we actually finished the book. It's called Purple on the Inside. And I know that's a funny title, uh, but the reason we called it Purple on the Inside is that one of his favorite books uh, was a, per was a uh, book called Purple Cow which was written several years ago. Many of you probably have read it. It's one of the most popular marketing books out there, Purple Cow. Um, and 
Kirk really applied some of the principles of Purple Cow to, uh, to J.B. Hunt, but he felt like it was missing something. The, 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 the framework of Purple Cow was missing something. And he and I started talking about this, I think back in 2016, and we decided to write this book together, which is now out. It's called Purple on the Inside. Um, and I loved working with him on that. Um, I learned something. If you ever want to write a book about a company, do it with the chairman of the board. <laughs> and the reason is, it's always so hard to get data and approvals, but when you're dealing with the chairman of the board, you can get the, uh, the data really easily and the approvals. So it was really nice. But but that was something that we, we worked on. Um, I'm writing a book right now, co-authoring a book uh, that won't be out for probably six months. But we've interviewed, um, I don't know, maybe 50 really good leaders. And it's value-based. So it's about value-based leadership. There's all kinds of frameworks out there. But the one I like the best starts with um, uh, two, two articles that are in the Harvard Business Review, have been in the Harvard Business Review. One was in 2001 by John Cotter. And if any of you are interested, uh, just email me and I'll send you uh, my framework. My email address is mwaller at walton.uark.edu. Be happy to send it to you. Uh, but there was one by John Cotter in 2001, and another one by uh, several authors in 2007. And I'll explain it this way. It's interesting. They, they approach leadership in two different ways. John Cotter, who's been probably one of the most prolific writers on leadership in history, um, he said leaders do three things. They set direction, they gain alignment, and they provide motivation. And, um, and I really like that. And that was, that was pretty much the model I started looking at as I was leading going forward. But then I added this other model in. And so if you think about it, um, Cotter talked about the what leaders do. They set direction, they gain alignment, they provide motivation. These other researchers looked at how leaders lead. So how do they actually do those things? And there's four four main tools they use. One is uh, sense making. And sense making means like, for example, looking at what's going on around our, our organization, looking at what's going on within our organization and being able to interpret it in a way that's relevant to the organization. This is a very challenging skill to develop, um, but it's very powerful. So in other words, you see something going on and then as a leader, you explain to the organization how that's relevant and what we need to do differently. The second thing um, that uh, is a how of leadership is relating. This is the most basic. And, um, you know, not all leaders are good at relating. Some are, right? But it helps a lot. If you've ever worked for uh, in an organization where the leader didn't relate well to people, you know how big of a problem that is, right? Um, and we see this in industry, we see it in academia, and we see it in politics. Good communicators, good relators can make a big difference. But, but sense making, the first one I mentioned, along with relating, you put those two together, it's very powerful. Uh, the third one is visioning. And visioning is really important. Visioning is being able to create a mental model for people, a mental image. It helps them understand what's going on, what the future might look like, and what we're trying to actually accomplish. Um, it's a, and, and again, you know, no one is great at all four of these, right? You need a team to be able to do it. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. But visioning is the third one. And the fourth one is inventing. Inventing uh, can help in many ways. For example, when you have a, a roadblock, a barrier. Uh, inventing means coming up with new ways to do something or to get around a barrier. Um, or you may have a new opportunity, but there's a maybe you don't have the resources to get there. 
inventing a way to accomplish or to take advantage of this new opportunity um, is without additional resources is a really important leadership skill. So of those four hows, you know, sense making, relating, visioning, and inventing, as I said, nobody is good at all of those. You know, you, you can do some of them, but you need a team of leaders who complement one another and are able to actually uh, do all that. And then you have to, as a team, you know, go back and say, how are we setting direction? How are we gaining alignment? And how are we providing motivation? Using those four uh, hows. I'm, the Walton College is fortunate. My three associate deans um, and my uh, CFO, my director of diversity and inclusion, my director of development, uh, my di director of uh, uh, public relations and marketing. Um, our team complements one another. Uh, none of us are strong in all these areas, but we truly are looking out for the best for one another. And that's a cultural thing. So, so on the one hand, right, you've got this framework for leading, which has to do with the how and what of leadership but you've got to have a culture that serves as a base for allowing this to happen. And that's where things like trust come in, right? Because uh, for example, our leadership team has a very high level of trust of one another. We respect one another. We like one another. Not all cultures have to be like that. We elected to develop a culture that is more family oriented, where we really care about one another. It's, you know, you have all different dimensions of, of culture and you can, you can elect to uh, emphasize one or another. Um, and, um, and so uh, how we use this framework to, uh, to, to pivot during the pandemic, I have written up and I'd be happy to share with you. But one of the first things I did is our team got together and created a video one for the faculty and staff, and one for the students. It was very short. We sent it out. And the purpose of that was to one, relate, and two, to, um, to uh, basically set direction. You know, we're gonna be working remotely. Uh, we're gonna be teaching remotely. Things are changing. Um, I won't go into all the things we did, but I filled out a grid. You can imagine um, a grid of, uh, the how of leadership and the what of leadership and all those cells we filled out with what are we doing and the benefit of that was it helped to us identify what we weren't doing it helped us identify who on our team should fill in those cells uh, i'm telling you it's super effective it's it's really amazing so that's the basic framework now um, i want to read a question what are some of the strategies you and your team are doing to prepare for the return of students while keeping everyone safe? Uh, this is a great question. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, and it's, it's, it's on everyone's minds. Um, and of course, safety is first. And we're fortunate that our chancellor is doing a great job of um, coming up with a plan, um, developing a plan and helping us set direction but then, so, so the university's come up with a, a guide that's published on our website, but it, it, it's good from a, I would say it's good from a setting direction perspective. It's good in terms of getting us aligned. And I think it's good in terms of visioning, helping us to think about what the future is gonna be like. What's it gonna be like to have masks on in the hallways and in the classrooms and so forth. So, um, so, we, uh, so we've got all kinds of teams around campus that are, that are working on this. Um, and then within each of the colleges, we have teams because each, each of our colleges are different. For example, in the Walton College, we don't have a lot of labs to worry about. Uh, John English in engineering and Todd Shields, they have lots of labs to worry about. Um, I think it makes it a little more complicated. What makes our situation very complicated is we 
if you look at the number of students we have per major, for example, it's really high. So we have, we have buildings that are absolutely at capacity. We have classrooms that are at capacity. So that makes our job difficult uh, in some ways. Uh, so applying the framework, one of the first things we did, of course, uh, to get ready for opening in the fall. Once we knew we were going to open in the fall, we had to get ready. I sent out a video of the four, uh, our, our leadership team sent out a video to faculty and staff. And uh, part of my message was, this is not business as usual. We can't think of it as being business as usual, either in terms of how we deliver educational content or in terms of how we think about safety. And, um, and I, I, I really explained, this is gonna be difficult um, because the, the professors will be teaching both face-to-face -face and remote. And here's how it's gonna work essentially. So we're gonna have like 33% capacity in a classroom. That will allow for students to socially distance, right? And they'll, they'll also have to wear a mask, which will make it less enjoyable in the classroom, unfortunately. Um, but the rest, of, so, so on Monday, for example, students would, a third of the students will be face-to-face, -face, two thirds will be remote. Well, the teachers then have to learn, how do I deal with that situation? That's very different than what they've dealt with before. So, so when you're teaching face-to-face, -face, there's a tendency to ignore the people who are online, for example, right? It's very difficult to, to consider both. Um, so, uh, so at any rate, we, uh, if you're teaching, let's suppose right now I'm teaching, okay, the, the four hows of leadership include, um, one of them is visioning. Um, Katie, would you tell me what you think about visioning? Have you seen it in your organization? Assuming I'm talking to MBA students, for example, whatever it may be, um, right? You've got to remember to stop and interact with the students who are online just as much as you do with the students that are in class, maybe more. And I think when it's possible, it's good to actually have a teaching assistant that can address questions that come up online and tell the professor, hey, so-and-so just asked a question, and here's the question. Because it's hard to manage, you know, when you're teaching something, especially if it's um, difficult, um, then, um, you know, you're thinking a lot about what you're teaching. And, um, and you're trying to deal with the students in class, and then it's real easy to ignore those online. Um, we, as we go back, you know, we're going to encourage people to work remotely, faculty and staff as much as possible. And how much they can work remotely depends on the function they serve, but their safety is first. So, you know, if they have pre-existing conditions or comorbidities that would make them more susceptible to COVID-19, um, then of course we want them to teach online strictly. Um, now we, we may then still have some classes for that class where we have a teaching assistant there or someone else. Uh, we, we don't have all that quite figured out yet. We're working on it. Um, sense making, I wanna get back to sense making on this topic of getting ready for, for opening up. Um, I have the, the, the deans of the business schools in the SEC meet twice per year. But starting in May, we've started meeting through Zoom for two hours every month. So we've done two like that so far. And you can imagine why, right? There's so many things going on in the world. I wanna know what other people are thinking, you know? And so we share best practices and it's really effective. It's been so effective actually, we may keep doing it. I mean, you know, 
it's it, it, every single one of us feel like we come out of those meetings with tangible things we can do. That's a part of sense making. So a part of sense making requires boundary spanning, spanning the boundaries of the organization uh, and benchmarking against uh, other organizations. And it's really confusing because there's so much out there. You know, there's a lot of noise and it's hard to know what is true and what is not true uh, about what's going on for opening um, in, in the fall. Uh, you know, within the University of Arkansas, we're very fortunate in a number of ways. Um, I mean, we're doing better uh, than a lot of universities are at this point. And, um, and so we're very fortunate in that way. Um, in terms of um, faculty, faculty need to come in to teach for sure if they're in the classroom, but if they have illnesses that would make it dangerous for them to come in. We don't want them to come in. Um, now we can't force them not to come in, obviously. I mean, many of them are ready to come in and, and teach. Um, and you know, there's some of them that I would like to uh, force to stay home because I know they have some pre-existing conditions, but, um, but we have a very dedicated faculty. Uh, the students, um, oh, one other thing on setting direction, when I sent the the uh, video to the students, I talked about the, 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 the values of the Walton College. This includes excellence, professionalism, innovation, and collegiality. Uh, epic, we call it epic. And our vision, the vision of the Walton College has two pillars. One is about thought leadership and the other is about um, serving as a catalyst for transforming lives. And so what's really cool is epic, ties to our vision in a direct way. Be epic. You think about serving as a catalyst for transforming lives, that's making sure that our students adopt epic values in doing business. Um, and epic was uh, developed by um, our uh, external relations team, uh, Be Epic. It's a, it's kind of a, a sub brand that we use quite a bit, but it really is good. It's, a, it's again, it's a part of that visioning thing. What does it mean to transform lives? What are we doing? We want our students to be epic. Well, so in the video I sent about the reopening, you know, I said, hey, um, we look forward to seeing you in the fall. We miss you. However, a big part of being epic will be following the guidelines we present for safety around COVID. You know, so we want you to come back. We look forward to having you back, but it's not normal. It will be different. It will be a little less comfortable. So, so I think that's, that's again, you know, when you, when you look at the leadership grid, it helps you understand, oh, I need to, Here's, here's, a, here's a part of the grid that I've missed. And thank you, David, for sending the, the link to that, to everybody, appreciate that. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, I would like to take a moment to, um, if you have any other questions or you wanna, you can ask me about anything, actually. I, I'm fine with that. Anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, we have a question. I'll read it. Can I promise you to get the top number? Oh, Aaron's helper is going to ask a question. <laughs> That's great. Let me read one of the questions. Let's see. Um, it says, uh, from a company or a, or a classroom perspective, do you have any advice on establishing a company culture or creating a community environment when team members are remote and no longer under the same roof in the traditional office? Ryan, that's a great question. Um, let, let, me, let me give you an example of something and then uh, talk to that and, and explain what the culture is, uh, the, the best definition that I personally like for corporate or company culture. Um, 
so early on when we were working remote within a month you know as dean right uh we've got a hundred faculty lots of part-time faculty over a hundred staff lots of part-time staff lots of students there's lots of people uh, 6,700, 600 people, uh, students, and then constituents from the outside, uh, including big benefactors. But they're all communicating with me sometimes and with one another. And periodically, um, right, emails get heated, right? You've all seen that, right? Someone sends an email and maybe someone doesn't take it the right way and it kind of escalates. My strategy has always been over the past five years to get up from my desk and walk to that person's office and to sit down and smile and be friendly, not even talk about that issue, ease into it. Or if it's other people involved and I get copied on it to bring them to my office. You know, but again, I, I approach them in a very kind and gentle manner. Um, to begin with and try to really understand what their their issues are. So I'll often repeat, if someone says something, I'll actually repeat it, say, let me make sure I understand you're saying this, is that correct? And it's funny, this resolves problems probably 99% of the time. Um, and you've got to do it quick though. What I've discovered in this new environment is that it's more difficult to deal with those kinds of problems uh, in this kind of setting. It, it, it can be done, but I think people feel that distance and they don't feel that you really, they can't feel your uh, empathy and your, your understanding because we, we interpret a lot of that through mannerisms, tone of voice, those kinds of things. And you can see the mannerisms, but there was actually an interesting article in the, uh, in the in New York Times, I don't know, it seems like it was over a month ago, and it said, why does it feel tiring to people after a day of Zoom meetings? Why does it feel unusually tired? And part of the reason is this, when you're talking to someone face to face, your brain is interpreting their expressions, their mannerisms, their tone of voice real quickly. I'm talking about milliseconds. You don't even know your brain's doing it. But there is a slight delay on a medium like Zoom or Microsoft Teams. It's not very noticeable to us but it's enough for our brains to get worn out with the confusion it causes. And, and so, um, so that's one of the problems, but let me get back to the culture piece of this and how it fits together. The best definition of company culture or institution, institutional culture is shared beliefs. In other words, the more an organization shares a set of beliefs, the stronger that culture. Sometimes that's good and sometimes that's not good. Uh, surprisingly, you do want a strong culture, but you've got to be careful about it. Um, and uh, so, for example, you know, if you want to, as a leader, if you want to instill certain values, then you need to reward behavior that fits those values and that culture quickly after they happen. This is hard to do because sometimes as a leader, like it's hard for me to know what's going on with everybody, right? Because there's so many people. So you have to, you have to instill this in your, uh, in your other leaders in the organization as well. It can't just be you. One thing I have is the, uh, the Epic Award the Dean's Epic Award. We have many awards in, in, the, in the university, in the college, but every now and then, and, and I haven't been doing it since we've been remote, so I don't think. Uh, actually, I take that back, I, I did once, but not as much. But typically, um, when I would see someone doing something that was just over the top, right? 
and fit so well with our vision and our values and we want it to be part of the culture. And I'd say, Lori, my admin, would you contact so-and-so and have her come to my office? We'd have a certificate, you know, printed out, a Dean's Epic Award, and I would explain why they were getting it. Uh, but also through email, you know, um, when you send emails to your organization, recognizing people doing things that fit the culture that we want. Um, and here's one thing that I'll say. It's true that people don't want meetings, right? People feel there's too many meetings. But if you don't invite people to meetings, they get mad too. Have you ever thought of that? It's kind of a strange thing. And it really means that we, we want meetings, but we want to make sure the meetings are effective. So one thing I think that's really good, if you can set agendas and have the agenda items as questions, instead of just, you know, we're going to um, review our personnel document. Instead of saying that, you could say, how should our personnel document change? For some reason, studies show that works a lot better. It makes the, the, the meeting uh, more effective. Um, I, I can't remember the reasons why I've read, but, uh, um, but at any rate, the other thing is people do want information. I'll give you an example, two examples. We, we're sending out videos almost every week to our faculty and staff. They're usually pretty short. And soon after we started doing that, um, my admin told me people were complaining that we were sending too many videos out. And I thought, I can see that, but I felt like, you know, there's so much going on. I want to tell people what's going on. And it's usually, it's usually like a, a video where you've got four, screen, four uh, screens, me and Ann O'Leary Kelly, uh, Alan Elstrand and Brent Williams. And we take turns talking. We think through a little before we talk. Most of it's extemporaneous, but we, we do it um, you know, pretty quickly usually. So, um, so we took a hiatus and we did it again. And I looked at the, and it was a little longer than normal. It was, it was uh, seven minutes long. I thought that's probably too long. But I looked at the statistics 70% of the people watch the entire thing. That's high. Our most recent one that we set, sent out on, um, I think we sent it out on uh, Monday. Yeah, Monday. We sent it out on Monday. It's the longest one we've sent. It was 11 minutes, way too long. And we didn't have time to prepare as well. In fact, when I watched it, I was embarrassed because I was going, um, uh, you know, I was like, it wasn't very good, uh, but, but over 50% of the people watched the entire thing. Some people watched it multiple times. What that tells me is people are hungry for information. And of course it makes sense. Anytime people are confronted with uncertainty and equivocality, they want information because it helps resolve it a little bit. Here's the thing though, Uncertainty is resolved with information, but equivocality has to be richer than that. So you have to be, you have to be, um, you know, sending emails. Uh, you have to be calling people. You have to have meetings, and you have to have videos. If you want to resolve equivocality, you need a very rich uh, kind of environment. And you might wonder what is the difference between the two. Uncertainty would be. When are we going to go back? Are we going to open? Are we going to go back to school or not? Or um, something like that. Um, it doesn't uh, require a rich set of information because you can say we're going to go back in the fall. We're going to have uh, classrooms at thirty-three percent capacity. On and on and on. Right. Um, but when you um, when you have something that's equivocal, 
for example, how are you, how are, how is the faculty feeling? How is the faculty and staff feeling about this remote work? There's no amount of information that's going to resolve that question for me. Um, and so the way to resolve it is interaction with people. So one thing our team did, the four of us, uh, took all the faculty and staff and broke them up into small groups and then had uh, Microsoft Teams meetings with them. And we just said, you know, how are you feeling? Is there anything we can do uh, to help you in this time? And we found lots of practical things. One thing we did is some people don't have good work chairs at home. And so I don't remember how many people, maybe 50 people or so, I can't remember, wanted to have their work chair at home. So we hired a company to load a truck full of their chairs and we that company delivered it to, to their homes. That's a really simple way to relate to people too. So, you know, the relating uh, aspect of leadership, um, you to be able to relate, you have to listen. And so that's part of what we were trying to do um, in that uh, situation. So um, let's see, there was a question, thoughts on, different um, thoughts on different types of leadership. People talk about servant and distributed leadership models. Yeah, there's, um, I would say there's probably about 12 categories of leadership models out there. And then there's lots of variations on things. For example, mine is a variation on, uh, a few themes actually, um, but uh, but paying attention to this for each of you, um, if you're leading anybody, it's really good to be thinking about leading right now because people need more leadership. Oh, let me tell you the dif one one difference between management and leadership. Management is about helping the organization cope with complexity. Leadership is about helping the organization deal with uncertainty and change, okay? So for example, management is about uh, dealing with complexity. So to deal with complexity, you need organizational charts, you need a budget, you need a hiring plan, um, you know, these kinds of things, that's, that's management. And that's really good with, uh, with dealing with um, complexity, but it's not good at dealing with change and uncertainty. So leadership is more focused on change and uncertainty. So my, my point is, of all the, the models that are out there, leadership is more needed right now than ever. I mean, in my lifetime, I'm 55 years old, um, and I've led a number of organizations. I've never felt like I needed more leadership capabilities than right now. And I'm sure you all feel that way as well. And it's, it's very uh, challenging. Um, but, but this question was about servant leadership and distributed leadership models. So servant leadership basically means that the leaders need to think of themselves as helping others to succeed, right? Um, not trying to take credit for things that everyone else is doing, you know, really giving credit where credit is due. That's hard to do in a big organization because sometimes you don't know where things came from or sometimes you don't remember uh, exactly where things came from. But as much as possible, uh, trying to, to have the frame of mind that you know, this is not about me. Being a leader in this position or this organization, it's not about me. It's about the people in the organization. And you've all worked for different leaders, right? I know I have. Um, right out of college, I worked for, my boss was definitely not a servant leader. Um, and I did, and, and then the next person I worked for was, and I really had, appreciated it. It helped me relate to him, helped him relate to me. Um, and um, it helped, uh, I think it helped everyone. I, th I think servant leadership is something leaders should do. 
regardless of the framework. Now, some of these leadership models don't have enough of a framework. It's like, okay, I know I need to prefer others, but what do I do? What am I missing? That's why I like uh, to use some kind of a framework, but I do think servant leadership and distributed le leadership is really important, um, especially as your organization grows. There's a tendency to want to micromanage in all human beings. If you really, if you really want your organization to do well, it's natural to want to micromanage because you want to make sure it gets done. But you have to step back at some point and let go. I'll give you a recent example that that I experienced. Soon after this happened, we created a pandemic task force, and this idea was one of my associate deans, Brent Williams. We had a number of people on that team. Our you know, our associate deans, some of our assistant deans, IT director, et cetera, et cetera. We met for 15 minutes every day. We went around the room. We said, what did we do today? No, what did we do yesterday? What are we going to do today? And what roadblocks do we have? That's what all of us did. And then it was, but we kept it to 15 minutes. If people had things they needed to talk to, they took it offline. 15 minutes every day. And I was on it. And I realized at one point, it just, I had kind of a revelation about a month into it that I was starting to micromanage. I would delegate things and then I would start doing those things or telling people what they should do. And I thought, darn it, I know this is not the right thing to do. So I asked my team, I said, do you mind if I step off of this 15 minute call every day? They were probably clapping, uh, but, but I stepped off of it and it's done great. And I get updates once a week. Now, sometimes I come into information and I'll share it with them. But, but you know, the pandemic is such a big deal. It's scary as a leader to trust that to your team. How are we going to deal with this? You know, you want to get, but I've got to deal with other things too. There's just a, a lot of other things I have to deal with. Uh, in the college, uh, the financing, uh, the, 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 the hiring of, of people, um, facilities issues, um, benefactors. There's just so many issues to deal with. If I tried to do that with every single issue, then I would be ineffective at all of them. And so I have to have leaders that I trust, and that's the distributive model. Uh, one thing I wanted to share with you um, you know, if you're interested in some of these things and learning more about them, our executive education group does a terrific job. Um, we've got executive education in Little Rock and executive education in Northwest Arkansas. And it's not that expensive, but we have, um, we have all kinds of, um, you know, leadership programs that people, uh, teach and they're usually very effective. Um, one of the ones that we have that's starting tomorrow in Little Rock, uh, you all wouldn't be able to be a part of because it's already set, I believe, um, is called Leadership Circle for Banking. So it's banking executives and it's a, it's a multi-week program, I don't know, or multi-month program, I don't know how long it goes. I don't know the details. Again, I've trusted that to uh, one of my associate deans to manage and, and uh, people uh, in the organization, but uh, they're going to actually be face to face. It may be one of the first programs that the University of Arkansas has had face to face um, since uh, since this uh, COVID pandemic. Um, but they will be using the guidelines. Uh, actually, they're going way above and beyond um, the minimum standards. That's for sure. And there are a couple of people that won't even be there physically. They'll be doing it remote uh, for various reasons. So um, it'll be our first time, you know, to really experiment with this. And um, but our facility in um, Little Rock is um, it's right it's right on the corner of Second uh, and Main. It's uh, right across the street from the Capitol Hotel parking lot. Great location. But it's a big enough space to where 
the, the size of the group that's in this is small. This is a small group of uh, executives in, in banking. And so it's actually going to be easy to implement, especially since some people are going to be remote. Um, the other thing I'm just going to mention real quickly is that we have talked to students. We've surveyed students. We have, um, we've done uh, bigger group discussions with students. And we've also, we've also done interviews, recorded interviews with individual students that are a half hour long. Remember I told you equivocality takes a lot of different sources, media sources. So we've done a lot of different things to understand what students are thinking. Um, the reason that's important is we need to understand how serious do students take these health issues? One, uh, are students even wanting to come back? What, what are they thinking about these things? But we, we um, our entire executive committee, which includes the associate deans, assistant deans, and department chairs, we watched the videos, the half hour videos of each of these students and took notes on them. So, um, so I spent two hours watching video, video interviews of students and each of our uh, team did. And we looked at the survey results. We looked at other sources we have. We're continuing to do that. We're, we're going to double down on this. Um, we should have been doing it for, for years, actually. We should do it every year. Any, any other questions? OK. Well, I hope that was helpful to you. Um, I want you to know um, I deeply appreciate each of you. Um, we are so grateful for our alumni. Uh, you really are a good part of the reason why uh, our college is so successful. Uh, so thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dean Waller. We really appreciate you coming on today and being part of our Lunch and Learn series.